like to begin the South South Innovation Showcase. Uh, and this is where we're going to uh, bring on stage three enterprises that are, that, ha that are either expanding from India into Africa or from Africa into India. Each of the entrepreneurs will get to pitch for five minutes, tell you about their experience of expanding out of their country or their region, and, and then we will throw it up into the audience for questions. Please feel free to put down notes and ask them some tough questions on why they're expanding, what their challenges are, what made them go to, to the region that they're expanding into. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Shannon of Bridge International Academies. Um, Shannon co-founded Bridge where she serves as both Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Development Officer leading the development pipeline in Kenya as well as international expansion. Bridge is now exploring an expansion to India and I'm just going to let Shannon tell you more about her experience. We may not play the whole thing, but at least then this way you can see some visuals. You can see some visuals of what our, um, our academy locations look like and get a sense of our teachers leading. I'll go into it a little bit more detail, but as it's showing, we have teacher computers, our internet-enabled e-readers that all of our teachers use for leading our classrooms every day. It's how we digitally distribute all of our curriculum across um, some 3,000 classrooms right now. We invest a tremendous amount of resources into our teacher training and into developing uh, manipulatives or you know, practical hands-on learning items for our children. Those of you in Kenya, you'll know the KCP is a critical life exam. So we're preparing all of our children to succeed at that. Uh, the majority of children in Kenya fail that exam. We're looking to change those statistics. And the data that's going up there right now is on our assessments that we've been doing with um, the early grade reading assessments and early grade mathematics assessments, testing our first, second, third, and fourth graders. These are some of our parents. It's almost over. In this section, you can't hear it. But they're talking about what they want to be when they grow up. For those of you who live in Kenya, many children want to become a pilot. Uh, that last child actually totally shocked me. She wanted to become a dentist. Um, one of them wanted to become a teacher. But at least now you've seen a little bit of the children we work with, the communities that they're from, what the schools look like. So again, I'm Shannon from Bridge. Bridge International Academies. It's the world's largest chain of low-cost preschools and primary schools working to bring world-class education to the poor, democratizing the right to learn. So there are a lot of things we do to make that happen. And at the bottom, I just wanted to give you a sense of where we are today. I'll talk you through some of the problems that we're solving in Kenya and some of the problems that exist globally, how this works for us, and then you know, looking at in some ways, unfortunately, that these aren't particularly Kenyan problems. They're continental problems and they're in fact global problems, which is why we'll be expanding to India in the next year. So currently we have more than 80,000 children that we educate every day here in Kenya from three-year-olds to 14-year-olds. Our average family lives on $1.24 per day per capita, calculated by World Bank standards, and is therefore living far below Kenya's own poverty line. We're hoping to reach more than 10 million children in the next 12 years or so. Uh, we currently operate almost 260 academies here in Kenya. We charge between 380 and 680 shillings per month, depending on whether you're in preschool or in upper primary. We currently employ more than 3,000 people. Um, just under 3,000 of those people are our teachers and create lots of jobs in adjacent sectors. Uh, from construction, printing, uh, manufacturing. 
So what issues does Bridge solve as we're thinking about how we can drive change, right? There's got to be a problem if you've got a solution. So right now, there are more than 800 million pre-primary and primary age pupils living in poverty globally. Seven million of those 800 million live here in Kenya. Unfortunately, children in um, you know, how it's defined as a developing country still perform in the third percentile compared to children in OECD countries. I mean, that's abysmal. But it's not because these children can't learn or these children aren't intelligent. It's because, you know, honestly, not many people are actually teaching them. In 2013, 56% of Class 8 pupils failed to pass the KCPE. In Kenya, that's basically the end of your progress in your social and economic life. It sets your socioeconomic status. 47% of the time, teachers in Kenya are either actually absent or actively neglecting their classroom. Asleep, on their phone, outside, drinking tea. That means that a child is only having an adult leading a classroom two hours and 19 minutes a day. 35% of teachers within Kenya didn't pass an exam on the curriculum they teach for their own class level. So it shouldn't probably be too surprising that 75% of low-income families in Kenya are looking for a better option for their child if they could find one. And 43% of low-income families today in Kenya send their child to a private school. Most people don't know that. There are more than 6,000 low-cost private schools spread across the country, not just here in Nairobi or places like Mombasa, but in small towns like Makutano and West Pakot, like Kapteket, uh, Nguria, they exist because this is a problem that families are trying to solve every day for their own children. And the issue is, can there be resources to actually solve quality education through a private provision model? If you look at the income levels within, within um, our families and what they're currently spending today, what families living below the poverty line spend today to send their child to school, whether it's unauthorized fees at a public school or at a low-cost private school. The existing market for education provision for their low-income families is $51 billion annually. There is a market out there. There is a need, but it's about whether there will be services that actually meet the need of these families. That's where Bridge comes in. So at Bridge, with, at our 259 schools across Kenya, we teach eight hours and 25 minutes a day compared to two hours and 19 minutes. And we have 0.7% absenteeism amongst our teachers compared to 47%. That results in, on average, pupil on pupil growth baseline for incoming performance, an average of 35% higher scores on reading, and 19% on maths. For our lowest performers, for the children who come in scoring at, in the bottom quintile, we get more than 205% improvement in reading and 44% improvement in maths. So we do our best work with the children who are most in need and helping them radically change their trajectories. How do we do that, right? There's always like, how did you get there? So we're very committed to having a true R&D-focused company where we use data to drive every decision we make. So we have a global R&D team based in Cambridge, Massachusetts that drives our academic testing, our own internal m and &E programs, and publishes our curriculum. We create everything we use in our schools. We're completely vertically integrated as an education company. So we do our own teacher training, we create our own manipulatives, we create our own textbooks, um, and then we use something that's critically important to enable our children to learn, which is a scripted instruction methodology. We use this, we deploy it through internet-enabled tablets and through Android-based smartphones to ensure that we can publish our curriculum on a daily and weekly basis to all of our teachers. So as you saw in the video, the teachers in the classroom aren't creating their own lessons. It's one of the ways we're able to empower them to succeed in the classroom. They have lessons that have been tested for 15 plus hours, videotaped, analyzed, that then they are able to deliver inside the classroom. Some of the technology we use to drive efficiency and scale. So where is this gonna bring us? So 
um, to give a little sense of the business model for those of you concerned on that side, some people think it's not possible to do this in an economically sustainable way. We do. Um, each of our academies covers its operational costs by the end of the first year and will recover its upfront CapEx costs over the four year period. But there's, I'll skip some of this detail so we can do more of it in questions. The real key is here, and this relates to both why we scale so rapidly, why we've moved from two people to 3,000 in five years, one academy to 260 in four years, and why we'll be moving to India um, this year, is that in order to do this type of investment, to, to give this radically different of a product offering to someone who earns $90, for their entire family of five in a month. You have to be able to amortize your costs over an incredibly large base. So if you look at graph on the bottom with the red and the green and the blue, so that blue, you know, those are our massive costs today that we're investing in our technology, our backend ERP systems, our teacher training, our textbook publishing, all of those pieces that are actually very heavy and very expensive that any given one school trying to serve families living on $1.24 per capita could never do. You wouldn't have the money to be able to do it. You can only do that if you imagine a business model, if you imagine a value proposition that isn't about serving 100 customers or even 10,000 customers, but is about serving a million customers. And if you shift your point of view to that way, and unfortunately, in this problem we're solving, there are 800 million kids who need a different product offering. If we can serve just 500,000 of them, a million of them, we'll be radically changing their lives, and then this is a sustainable business model. It's less risky to do that in multiple countries than in just one. So you can also see, you know, as over time, our overhead expenses become minuscule, compared to the populations we're serving. That we also expect in the next um, several years to be highly involved in both India and Nigeria, much larger markets than Kenya, and to be having most of our growth of our customers to be in Nigeria and in India over the next four years. We'll start operating in Nigeria in either late 2014 or early 2015, and in India we'll be matriculating pupils in early 2015. So this was just a little slide to try to connect it back a little bit to India in the sense of these problems that I mentioned that we're already solving in Kenya, they exist there too. I mean, it's kind of the sad state of education in most of these countries. So there are more than 300 million pre-primary and primary age children in India alone who are living in poverty or low-income families. They also are performing in the third centile. In India, there are 45% of teaching time every day in primary schools lost to teacher absenteeism and neglect. Currently, the majority of urban low-income families in Andhra Pradesh already send their children to a low-cost private school because they're desperately searching for someone to give them a solution to educate their children. It's estimated that there are more than 300,000 low-cost private schools existing across India today. We get to the same global market number. There's a market here if someone can solve it if someone can come up with an idea that could actually reach these children and change their lives. We expect to have the same academic outcomes in India. We'll teach the same long day. And through that same technology, we'll be able to have minimal teacher absenteeism. So there we go. There's Bridge in Kenya, Bridge heading to India. I know you guys wanted us to be short so we could have lots of questions. Thanks, Shannon. That was a great presentation. Any questions in the audience? Thanks. It was a great presentation. Um, I have one question that I'm curious about. It seems like a lot of your costs are for the R&D for developing the curriculum. And I'm wondering how uh, transferable that is to a different country like India, where 
you know, you're gonna be translating to a different language, but also I imagine like the standardized tests are probably different in India, and I'm wondering if that, just cost-wise, what does that look like for taking on that additional set of curriculum? Yeah. Um, so in basic education, which we, def you know, internally we think of as ECD and primary, and primary can be defined differently in different countries. Here it's defined up through class eight. Um, in, in India it's technically class five, but some schools go up to class eight. We're being pushed by certain, um, certain states that they want us to offer up to class 10, uh, which would push us much higher than we have normally thought of going. At ECD, there's almost no change other than language, right? So like the basic concepts you want a child to learn at age three, four, five, that parallel with cognitive development and the types of activities you want them to do, fine and gross motor skills, language acquisition, um, are, are shared across there. In early primary, there's still 70, 80% overlap in almost everything except for social studies or like your history class. Maths doesn't really change. Like the standards between um, US, Germany, and Kenya of what a child should learn in class one, two, three, four, five are basically the same in mathematics. In science, there's a ton of overlap. Um, the big difference you'll see between a country like the US and Kenya and its science curriculum for the early grades um, is that there's a lot more agriculture and there's a lot more disease education in a country like Kenya. But in countries we're looking to serve, that overlap also exists. So if you look at the curriculum standards in Nigeria, similarly, there's a lot more agriculture, there's a lot more disease education. Um, so we look at most of that investment, particularly because in our first three years of expansion, we're looking at English medium of instruction countries. So where the primary language of instruction is English, that between 65 and 70 or so percent of our curriculum should be reusable with minor changes according to differences of this might get taught in class six versus this gets taught in class four. Um, like there's certain changes like that will happen, but they're not that, they're not that significant. Um, the, one of the big costs that's 100% leveraged across systems is all of the back end technology we use for distributing our curriculum. Like so we develop all of our own software. So everything we use to run our internet internet-enabled tablets to run how we operate our schools on the smartphones, that's completely translatable across all of the countries. We look at a new, a new country will take, depending on some of these changes, um, between a million and a half and two million dollars of like upfront change, you, you know, like just like tact, you know, like the cost of change related to our curriculum, some of the coding, some of the ways we're going to connect with the banks or other computer systems on the other end. Do you want me to call on people or were you? Hi, I'm, I'm Milton Laurie from Kenya. Um, I just have a question for you around um, scale within the Kenyan context. And uh, given that the, the biggest investor in, in education, particularly at the stage at which you're operating is the government, um, the government invests in curriculum development, employs teachers. Um, what has been the, the feedback, positive or negative? To what extent is the business model that Bridge uh, has in Kenya being replicated or picked up um, within, 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 within the, the, the ecosystem? And uh, you know, do you see um, the ability to scale, say, within Kenya, as not necessarily bridges expanding, but just that other people uh, are picking up on the methodology uh, that you yourselves are, 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 are executing on, and that um, scale is actually happening not necessarily through you, but uh, as it were, through spreading the gospel, as it were. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. And it actually highlights something a little bit different that's happening in India. Um, when we started here, we were one of the first groups trying to push some of the, push the edge 
of what is allowed in kind of education reform and education practice in Kenya. And now that we're five years in, and we have really good solid four years of data showing our academic results, we get a lot better traction when we meet with our friends in the ministry, and a lot better um, work in setting up larger partnerships and collaboration. Um, so a couple of things that have already like scaled outside of Bridge, like related to things that we do, is that we were the first institution to work on something called scripted instruction in Kenya, which is where you, you, take, you separate content creation and content delivery for the teacher. So instead of the teacher creating all of their lessons for themselves every day, you have master teachers or specialists who create that for them. And we saw some of our earliest gains in the first classes we did that with in 2009 and 2010. And so then there were USAID studies of what we were doing related to that. And now there is a massive testing, um, you know, testing of it. It was a pilot, now they're rolling it out countrywide, of USAID working with the Ministry of Education to create new curriculum materials for the public schools, specifically in reading and in maths for classes one and classes two, where they are having master teachers write the lessons for the, the public primary school teachers and shift that burden of content creation off of the teacher because you get such higher gains when you no longer expect every teacher to be a specialist in how to teach a six-year-old phonemes, and that you actually give that to a specialist and allow the teacher to become a classroom leader and a real deliverer of that knowledge. So that's a, a kind of a big scale up that we're really glad is happening that USAID's been working on in the past couple years with the ministry. Um, we always, um, when we talk with the ministry and with groups like KICD or, or with NEC, that everything we do, we do on somewhere between a fifth and a tenth of what the government spends per child per year. So anything we do can be done by the ministry at a massive cost savings. So we encourage them to look at us as a free pilot. Allow us to operate, allow us to do this, even at 80,000 children, we are minuscule compared to the reach of the ministry. You know, we have 260 schools now, the ministry has 23,000 primary schools. Use us as an experiment because we have less, um, less history and bureaucracy that holds us back from, from rapidly trying new things and pushing them forward. And then to be able to use our data, which we can share with them, to maybe be able to take arguments a little bit further inside the ministry. So we've gotten a lot closer partnerships with them in the past 18 months, and we're hoping that will continue forward. Thank you, Shannon. And I know that there were some more questions, but I'll encourage you to take that up with Shannon offline because uh, she's here with us for a while, and she also has team members in the audience. So I'm happy. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer. But thank you, Shannon, for joining us here today. It was a great presentation. Thanks. Good luck as you come into India. Great, so on that note, we'd like to present uh, another company that's um, actually already operating across um, the Global South. They're operational uh, here in Sub-Saharan Africa and also in um, Latin America and are now looking to move into India. Uh, let's welcome Louis Oburu, Regional Manager, East Africa at Scope Insight. Louis believes that agriculture is the mainstay of Africa's economies uh, and is uh, passionate about improving lives and livelihoods of the African people through transformational power of affordable and sustainable finance. Louis, we're happy to have you here today. Come up on stage and I'll help set up your presentation. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm here to talk about Scope Insight. Uh, Scope Insight, this is a Netherlands-based company. We are based in Utrecht in Netherlands, uh, but we're very much present across the globe. We believe that the challenge that we have for this decade is basically access to agricultural finance. So as Scope Insight, we are positioned ourselves as the first credit rating and business assessment organization, and we focus on producer organizations. 
And when we talk about producer organization, we are basically talking about SMEs that are in the area of agribusiness or agriculture, dairy, livestock, aquaculture, and forestry. And over and above the SMEs, we also work with cooperatives that are also working in the respective area that we're talking about. As an organization, we do realize that there is a significant gap that exists between agriculture being a source of employment to very many people across Africa specifically. And we do recognize that the amount of money that is held in terms of loan books with respective financial institutions is not commensurate to the employment levels that are actually created. And there is also a discrepancy between employment the gross domestic uh, product within a country that agriculture contributes as well as the loan facilities. So we do hope that we would be able as an organization to put information from the farmer produce organizations in a way that allows them or allows the banking or the banks or financial institutions to actually interpret this information. So we are translating information from farmer to what is or can be easily um, appreciated by the financial institutions. Some of the barriers that we have within the agricultural finance is that we recognize that most of the financial institutions will say that agriculture is very high risk and the farmers do not have collateral. And if they have collateral, the people who do the farming specifically are women and the land in most cases is either owned by the community and if it's not owned by the community, it is owned by the men. And therefore, in the case that they would like to take any loan facilities as they try to increase productivity within the farms, they face a challenge of not being able to have the collateral. We also recognize that from a banking point of view, they probably would have other viable channels of creating um, profitable ways of creating um, income for their organizations. And agriculture doesn't very much seem to be an alternative profitable route simply because of other barriers that exist within the agricultural setup. And also the dependency on rain and other factors that are with beyond the human control. We also recognize that they've had very bad experiences on high default. Uh, bankers and farmers do not tend sometimes to, to speak the same language. And they also feel that sometimes farmers are literally or not bankable. Yet we know that there is potential in changing this information. So we work, we recognize we have three tiers, if I would call them the three tiers. We have the very organized farmer companies that are well established and have been in existence, existence over a period of time. And they continue to be organized, and that is where probably most of the financial institutions would tend to focus on. We also recognize that we have the smallholder farmers, which most of the NGOs, as well as um, microfinance institutions, are working very closely with smallholder farmers. And also there is a low yield, and they are sometimes tend not to be very much organized. But yet we recognize that as the smallholder farmers grow, they tend to grow into very much well-organized groups that sometimes people do not tend to recognize that they have actually become so organized that they can actually be lent to. And those are SMEs as well as producer organizations that are well-structured. So our intention as Scope Insight is to move the missing middle to actually very organized SME farms which have high yield and can be able to optimally uh, benefit from financial institutions as well as any other capacity builder and any other institution that is willing to basically work with them. So there is an opportunity that lies within the missing middle, being the small and medium enterprises. So as we said, we are an independent assessment agency. We do score uh, produce organizations and SMEs between one to five, one being the lowest and five being the best. And we do this through using our tool and we, we use nine chapters to do the evaluation or the assessment. And the nine chapters will focus around supply, where does your income come from, how do you generate your income, are there any external risks that you're actually involved in and are there 
any mitigating factors in terms of weather, in terms of pricing that you could be uh, looking into. We look at operations. Are we optimally utilizing our full capacity as we operate within our enterprises? Or could there be any shortcomings? We look at internal management in terms of governance. We all know that when you talk about farmers, we are moving from illiterate to very literate. And therefore, in that case, we tend to have a mix of it. And this could also be a constituent within uh, the people who are governing the cooperatives. And so we look at internal management, their competency level, their skills, sustainability in terms of environment, as well as social sustainability, financial management, as well as administration of the finances. Do they have policies, procedures, amongst other things? We look at enablers. Who are they working with? Are they working with the government? Are they working with any other NGO or capacity builders or business development service providers within the country which we are operating in? We also look at the markets. Do they have existing contracts? And if they do, who are they having these contracts with? So like I said, we will score between one to five. And in each of the chapters, we will actually come up with a score that then gives us an overall score for the entire assessment. So again, we're saying this is a first step to an efficient and scalable agri-finance markets. We want to ensure that um, after we have actually, when you do the assessment, we are able to lead you to have good capacity buildings within the banking scenarios because, again, we recognize that some of the people who probably work in the agricultural departments within the banks may not necessarily have the competence that is required and an appreciation of agriculture in a holistic way, right through from subsistence farming to commercial farming. And then we also want to focus on capacity building that out of these assessments, the produce organizations can be able to identify the strengths and the weaknesses that they could be having, as well as areas of improvement that would enable them to grow to the next level. And at the end of the day, we do hope that we can be able to link them to financial institutions and be able to access credit. Like I said, we are operating in different parts of the world. I'll talk about just four areas that we are operating currently. The head office is in Netherlands. We have our East African office, and I'm basically taking care of the East African office. And when you talk about East Africa, it's basically Africa in totality. And then we have an Indian pilot that we did last year in 2013, and we have an office in Guatemala, uh, Central America. So when we did our assessments, we have noticed over time that the areas where we have gained a lot of competence or where we have found ourselves doing a lot of assessments is in the area of agriculture, which constitutes 76%. We have dairy and livestock contributing to 18%, and forestry around 6%. This has been clearly divided, as you would see from the chart. Mostly, most of the work has been done in East Africa, followed by Central America, West Africa, South America, and our new entry into India. Now, like I said last year, we did an assessment in India. Uh, there is a lot that we were able to, to, to learn and to discover in the, Indian, um, in the India assessment. And this was actually sponsored, or we were actually invited into India by ECO. So we trained three independent assessors, and we did 20 assessments in about five regions. And we focused, or we wanted to get to find or have a feel of what it is to actually do assessments in the agricultural sector within India. So we focused on five areas, Rajasthan, Bihar, uh, the names are pretty hard, you must admit, <laughs> Odisha, all right, I like the, the pronunciation, it could be very much different from my pronunciations, I thank you for that, uh, Jakhad and Maria Bardesh. <laughs> yes, and in all those places, we focus on agriculture, dairy, poultry, turmeric and tamarind, dairy, soya beans, uh, soy, uh, honey, as well as tea. When we look at the assessments that we have done across the globe, one of the areas that we recognize that most of the producer organizations are struggling with is financial performance, and that is well linked to having good internal management. So when you struggle with good internal management, we are struggling with financial performance. 
And that brings me to the end of the presentations. And these are some of the comments that we have actually received from the people we have actually um, assessed. I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Um, audience, any questions? I know we have a lot of people from uh, all, all, all the regions represented here, and, and we'd love to take questions. And if there are none, then I shall go ahead and throw one. Any? No, perfect. Okay, so uh, Louis, I wanted to ask you, if, is there one, the, are there a few major differences you've seen in the ca kind of farmer organizations that you're working with here in East Africa and as you expanded to India? I, I know that your p pilot uh, set was fairly small, but, but were there some key differences that came out? I think in terms of organizations, of the groups, it's very different. In Kenya, we basically talk about uh, cooperatives that have systems and structures and have also been in existence for a long period of time. In terms of the area of focus, in terms of um, the value chains that we actually focus on, in Kenya, a lot of it is usually coffee, tea, and dairy. Those are the very major um, cooperatives. But like I said in, our, uh, in my presentations, in India it was very much um, different. The groups are probably less organized than they are here in Kenya. And more specifically is that they're very huge in terms of um, the value chains. They were very different. We've not done much in Kenya in as far as, um, what do they call it, um, spices are concerned. But that was right. one of the major things right. that so, we realized in India. So let me come here and ask, did you think that your model needed to change then? Did your, did your assessment framework need to change as you were looking at a new country? Or, or did you find that it was more or less the same? I think it just depends with the tool remains to be. What needs to be different a little bit is the way the people who are conducting the assessments need to tweak the questions to the level of the people as well as in relevance to the area that they're actually focusing in. So we don't really need to change the tool. It's just an application process during the time that you're conducting the trainings. See. Okay, so on that note, thank you, Louis, for joining us here today. Uh, and I should tell you all that Louis has also agreed to come uh, join us at the Sankal Global Conference in Bombay. So we look forward to meeting her there as well. Uh, Kanika, if you could just present her with a token of your appreciation. Thank you very much. Great, and finally, so we've, we've been looking at this in sort of one direction, going from Africa into India. Let's try and reverse that direction now and look at someone who's, who's trying to expand from India into Africa and understand what that perspective looks like. So for that, next on stage, we have Sujay Santra, founder and CEO at iCure, um, which he started in 2010. Uh, and conceptualized a low-cost application that can connect rural patients with urban doctors. Um, welcome, Sujay, and tell us a little bit more about your plans to expand here in East Africa. Come up on stage while Kanika is setting that up. And audience, maybe you can all encourage Sujay a little bit. This is his first time in Nairobi. Hello, good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot to Sankalp and IntelliCab for giving us the opportunity to come over here and uh, talk about our work. Uh, it's been a great, uh, a great journey in the last uh, three days. Uh, definitely, it has opened uh, many of our uh, things that, uh, and it has definitely added to our belief that yes, definitely with the support that we can get from you, we would be definitely would be willing to uh, work over here. So briefly about iCure, uh, iCure is an organization which is in the process of setting up a chain of rural health centers that are equipped with qualified MBBS doctors, medicines, biomedical equipments, and our own indigenous software which is called Wireless Health Incident Monitoring System. Prior to setting up uh, the organization in 2010, I was working in IBM and Oracle for more than 12 years, and while doing so, uh, a couple of things and incidents led to the thing that 
how come technology can really bridge the gap between the patients and the doctors. So at ICOR, with the several months and years of uh, research, understanding, and on the ground, uh, we have come up with this solution. Uh, being in IBM and Oracle, it was very easy for us to, to try to adopt some technology which was available in US and in other parts of the developed nations uh, to try to fit it into the Indian context, but we did not do that. What we did is really try to uh, be on the ground, understand the technical challenges, understand the business challenges that were available, and that's how we were able to bridge the and build up the technology that we are able to adapt to the available resources in terms of the manpower, in terms of the internet. So we'll talk about in details. So uh, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the solution in India and how we can, we would be able to deliver such kind of similar situations in Africa, definitely uh, we would like to uh, mention over here that the situations in India and Africa is very similar when it comes to the rural healthcare problems. In Africa as well, we have more than 50% of the population uh, is do not have access to quality medical facilities. So uh, our technology solution actually works in three levels. Uh, like the, the last mile solution is uh, where even where there is no internet or electricity, wherein the community workers, they are trained on technology and on the medical facilities so that they can carry the tablets which is loaded with our own software that works like a virtual doctor. So this health worker, they can go to the patient's home on a door-to-door -door basis and in case the patient is having any pain, fever or any other related symptoms related to primary care, these entire data can be captured and the follow-up questions can be asked by the system. And when the health worker comes within the internet zone, this data gets synchronized with the doctors who is sitting at a hospital or in a clinic and they can suggest various kinds of things like nothing to worry, change the drug, change the dosage or bring the uh, patient to the hospital. I'd like to give an incident over here, like we were working in uh, Salboni in West Bengal in India, which is one of the very remote places where the patients, they have to walk more than 15 to 20 kilometers just to see the doctors. And in these places, the patients were, able, these centers were operational once in every 15 days. So when we arrived at noon at around 1.15 in the afternoon, the doctor had already left. So the patient had two options. Either they could have waited for next two weeks or they could have walked further 20 kilometers to, to see the doctor. So what we did is that we tried to help the patient out through various means and the patient were given the medicine and the consultation. So at iCure, what we are doing is that when the doctors are not available, these health workers, they can act as an interface between the patients and the doctors and they can intervene and uh, help the patients reach out to the doctors at any point. Many of us would be thinking that we are uh, kind of a telemedicine solution, but uh, let me say over here that we are beyond telemedicine. Telemedicine definitely has a lot of challenges, be it in terms of the infrastructural, be it in terms of the, the doctors need to be at the telemedicine facility, the patients need to be at the telemedicine uh, medicine facility, whereas in our case, the doctor can suggest the patients at any point in time from anywhere, and the patients can be, the data can be uh, captured and transmitted through various means. In terms of the data flow, uh, for instance, we have several other innovations which we are going through uh, various research collaborations across the medical universities like the uh, automated solutions through anemia and malaria wherein we would be able to collect the information through a, a mobile sensor and then these data would be collected and the uh, patients would be made available the data in just a couple of hours as against several weeks which is taking right now. So what is the advantage of the various stakeholders? In terms of the patients, the patients are able to get quality uh, primary healthcare treatment just within the community. That brings down the total cost of cure. The hospitals are definitely able to reach out to more number of patients. Definitely in terms of the government, they are able to uh, benefit through multiple uh, means because what we have seen is that the governments, they run through various programs and in many cases, uh, they, uh, due to the lack of the information or due to the lack of various uh, other facilities, they are not able to optimize their programs in an effective way. And definitely, uh, we have seen several universities and other research organizations who have uh, several solutions and uh, for them it becomes a hindrance to penetrate in these areas. 
So at iCure, we have built on the technology platform wherein we are open to integrate various kinds of low-cost, innovative uh, healthcare uh, you know, uh, mechanisms, be it uh, in terms of various biomedical equipments, be it in terms of other solutions, wherein we would be able to reach out to the patients through our technology platform in a very seamless way. So in terms of the last mile uh, healthcare delivery, as we have talked about, is definitely on the healthcare operations, wherein we are setting up the health centers in, uh, in India, in the eastern parts of India. Uh, when we talk about the Africa, definitely we would like to first uh, provide a collaboration wherein we would be able to provide the technology solution that would be able to fit into the context over here in this continent. And also we would be able to help in the increase in the overall health and hygiene of the people. Uh, in the last 14 months, uh, in the last two, uh, four years, uh, we had, uh, in the first two and a half years, we have piloted on the technology and the business model when we set up our first rural health center in November 2012. And in just more than 14 months, we have set up more than 12 health centers and we are aiming to set up more than 400 centers in the next four years. Uh, we definitely feel proud when we have seen that there are several cases wherein the patients who were suffering from very uh, uh, acute primary care uh, diseases like the, for instance, like there are severe hypertension, blood pressure and eye related diseases. Like we have seen patients who were able to see three mirror images of a single person and that they have been living for that for several years. And without treatment, they have been able to get cured and they have been able to join the, uh, join the work. So that has brought the livelihood for their families. So as we know that the, uh, the rural urban disparity in Africa is also in very similar context. So in Africa, we would definitely uh, look uh, for the collaboration, for the support. At iCure, we know that we are a very small organization and if you want to solve the, uh, the challenges, definitely we would be looking for the collaboration from various aspects that will definitely help us to come forward and uh, provide the solutions that is also applicable in Africa. A uh, couple of other uh, solutions wherein we have uh, provided, uh, we would like to mention is uh, we have started on the pilot in uh, one of the hill districts in Assam, which is the northern eastern parts of India. Again, this is again a very uh, remote place wherein they have uh, like five to six months in a year. There are extreme torrential rains and the patients, they are able to uh, completely disconnected with the doctors. So using our technology solution, they would be able to reach out to the doctors and they would be able to get timely intervention for the primary health delivery. We have also provided solution to ACOIN, which is a body of 390 ophthalmologists across the globe, wherein they are using our solution to treat patients uh, suffering from eye-related diseases. We have seen that many patients, they are suffering from cataract and matured cataract, and there are cases where beyond matured cataract, the patient leads to blindness. As we know that India is the blind capital of the world, definitely if we are able to timely intervene these diseases, we would be able to solve these issues. Uh, we have also started one walk with McGill University Canada for uh, the southern uh, districts in Odisha. Again, this is a very, very remote areas in India wherein we would be able to uh, find out various solutions related to the problems like anemia and other related diseases wherein we have seen that there are nutritional aspects which is directly impacting the health and the uh, livelihood of the people. So this uh, through the uh, McGill University, IFRI, Government of India, Pradhan and iCure, we would be able to solve the nutritional and the healthcare aspects in, in, the, uh, in these uh, four districts. And these are the couple of uh, recognitions uh, which we have got in last four years. So uh, that brings to the end of the presentation. It has been really an honor to come over here and see the warmth and affection of the people over here. Definitely given an opportunity, we would like to come and work here. Thank you. Thank you, Sujay. Thank you so much. Um, audience, do we have questions for Sujay? Well, uh, I'd like to quickly ask you a question, Sujay, if that's okay. I know that you spent the last two days here at Sankalp Africa Summit, and I'm sure you've also spoken with a few people about your expansion plans. What is it that you're hearing as feedback? Yeah, as feedback, uh, definitely what we have seen is that uh, uh, Eastern Africa, definitely it has a tremendous uh, growth potential and uh, definitely uh, we have seen that uh, the uh, innovations like in iCure which we have been working on definitely would be uh, uh, you know applicable in the African context 
so uh, one of our apprehension definitely is the support and collaboration which we would be looking for. Uh, if we get that, def uh, then we would be able to come and walk over here. Thank you, Sujay. Thank you. Um, and if there are, okay, there is one question at the back. Introduce yourself and your organization, please. Hi, I'm Daljeet. I'm from IP Hi. Global. I have a question on the challenges you faced in Assam. I mean, some of the technical and non-technical challenges there. Uh, in terms of the challenges, technical challenges, what we have seen is that, uh, uh, like, as, as being a technocrat, it, it becomes very, very, I would say, a drive to uh, develop some gizmos and be the best of the technologies to try and fit into the rural context. But uh, we have really controlled ourselves. We know that uh, there are, in, in, you know, internet challenges, bandwidth challenges. So our technology solution has been really, really simple. It works on a very low internet bandwidth speed. Uh, so uh, the solution, if you have a glance of it, you may not be the most glitzy one, but it solves the purpose. And also in terms of the other business challenges, in, the, in terms of the mindset challenges, which we have uh, definitely uh, seen and uh, we have learned and uh, modified and built our solutions around that. And uh, so far we have been successful in doing that. Okay, then on that note, thank you, Sujay. And thank I you. hope uh, the rest of the summit is also useful for you. You know, staying on the subject of South-South collaboration just a bit longer, I want to ask someone for comments here who's been a huge supporter of this idea of uh, developing countries helping each other. Um, Anil Sinha, who's head inclusive business at IFC South Asia. IFC is also a huge investor in businesses that have expanded across the South. Anil, tell us what you think. So I, I think this is an area really that needs to be built. Give it a minute. Thank you. Um, just like to share two more examples. I don't know if Manoj Sinha is here of Husk Power. This is a company that produces rice, from rice husk produces electricity off grid. It started off in Bihar, one of the rural areas, and now they've expanded, but they've expanded the model using franchise in Africa. So this is an example where a company doesn't need to go across. You train up entrepreneurs who can run it. So nine franchises already in Africa and, and really off grid. Uh, power really is, is, is absolutely critical. Another large company that couldn't come is Jain Irrigation, which started in India, uh, but it uses drip irrigation, micro drip irrigation, uh, also uses uh, solar vol vol voltaic pumps and, uh, and solar panels. Um, set up operations in Kenya, set up operations in, in, in Ethiopia now, and as you know, similar issues, marginal land holding, shortage of water, uh, low productivity, how you can get water exactly to the crops at the right time. Uh, otherwise, what happens usually in India that you don't, the farmer doesn't know when the electricity will come, so just leaves the, the electricity on and the pump on. So electricity comes at six, he may need it for one hour, but by the time he gets there, water is wasted completely and you can get more micronutrients. So uh, doing extremely well now in Africa, gen irrigation. But I think these are the kind of models, and I really like the models that have, been, that, that have come through earlier, that we should really look at how we can share, and, and we're encouraging IntelliCap to do a case study of what works and what has worked, to use that as a, a way of providing impetus to this South-South relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. <laughs> Great, and uh, we're now moving into the wrap-up of the conference. How time flies. I'm not sure if you've been noticing, but um, we've had someone who's been sort of hopping through all of your sessions, taking notes, writing down what she's seeing, and she's gonna come back here and report on it in just a minute. Uh, let me introduce her quickly. Her name is Amanda Feldman, and she's a director at Volans. And she's been working on this really interesting concept called breakthrough capitalism. That's not just about individual businesses acting more responsibly, but the entire capitalist ecosystem, I think, behaving more responsibly. And Amanda is going to talk to us about how she's seen breakthrough capitalism happen at Sankalp. Welcome, Amanda. Hello. Hi, you're still here. How is everybody? 
<laughs> well, they introduced me very well, but I have to admit, so you're probably wondering why I'm up there. I have a feeling as one of the newest partners with Sankalp, they just gave me the most enviable task of having to summarize an entire two days of brilliant conversations, amazing speakers. Um, I asked for some Twitter insight as well from the crowd. I got a little bit, but I'm sure uh, it won't be exhaustive. I uh, just have a little bit of time really to put what I heard um, in all of the sessions into a bit of perspective. And it wasn't just in the sessions, it was in the hallways, it was over drinks. Um, so I hope you all had as interesting of conversations as I did. And at Volans, as they mentioned, we really approach all of this as if the world is on fire, because it is. <laughs> Global warming, population growth, resource scarcity, we are really in a scary place, in a scary world. And some of that urgency is part of why I wanted to um, come and, and thank you for being here this long, because it's tempting to just hide under a rock, hug your family, cross your fingers, hear about the bad weather and traffic outside, and just stay put. But you guys braved the Nairobi traffic. I swear I've had just as many discussions about impact as I've had about the traffic in Nairobi. You've braved the traffic, you've come to the Sankalp Africa Summit, and you've had great conversations, as I said, throughout, throughout the entire day. And hopefully, you've dreamed up your own version of an inclusive business ecosystem. Whatever that looks like to you, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an angel and investor, and those really big ideas that are going to drive diverse and culturally relevant approaches to inclusive development in Africa. I'd like you to take those amazing ideas, stick them under your chair for a second. They might sort of fight you, but just put them aside for a second, because I want to put this, I want us to step back for a second. This is really complex. <laughs> we have a lot ahead of us, and these conversations are hopefully just the catalyst to something a lot bigger and a lot more collaboration. And what you see on the screen is, is really what we're up against. We've had deep dive sessions on education, food security, healthcare, water security, but these aren't happening in isolation. And while I can't be in four sessions at once, I tried, but I couldn't particularly be, we are all working on different parts of this much bigger system. It's this system of capitalism, of economics, that is, that is arguably not fit for purpose for a world of nine billion people by 2050 um, living well, living fairly, living affordably. So as we face these global governance failures, extreme weather patterns, economic disparity, fiscal crises, aging demographics, credit crunches, you can read them all on the screen, you get my point. <laughs> it looks like a, a downhill slope and they're symptomatic of this broken system. So if your ideas are battling to get out from under your chair, that's a good thing, because we really need them. But we need them to work together towards this much bigger system. And these ideas that you have will have to be fair, disruptive, ambitious, and future ready. So the grim picture I painted earlier is one of Oh, I can't change this slide, but hopefully someday it will. Um, is, is for the pessimists in the room. It's the breakdown scenario. It's not looking good. But I arguably think, that, and I think that every pitch that we heard yesterday started with an element of this breakdown scenario that an entrepreneur has spotted in their local communities. Um, but I actually, I'm an eternal optimist, and I think we might have a little bigger problem. And that's the change as usual trajectory. It is the stuff that's good, but not quite gonna get us to where we need to be. It's the celebration without the impact backing it up, which we heard a lot about this morning and yesterday. Um, and I'm gonna just h highlight a few things that I've heard throughout the conference that are warning cries for this change as usual scenario, just so we can keep them in mind um, as we build out these ideas that we've had. Um, you know, one is the impact zeal without the business case. Um, we've heard that pull on social entrepreneurs to, oh, there it is. See, 
breakthrough <laughs> change as usual and break down. And just some visuals, I know at the end of the day are helpful for everyone just to get through this. So change as usual, impact zeal without the business case. So it's social entrepreneurs that are focusing too much on the social and not enough on the entrepreneur, not enough on the financial case and what we need are viable market solutions. Um, with short term thinking rather than really long term horizons. And we heard this from investors, uh, we heard this from grant makers, we heard this from a number number of, of stakeholders in the room. Impact metrics for the sake of metrics, not impact. This came up in a round table yesterday morning. What are the purpose of impact metrics? And if it's for the sake of greater impact, let's go for it, but a lot of times um, they go around in circles. Um, the influx of impact capital without the training to use it wisely and apply it well. Enterprise growth, but growth that's happening informally that we can't really look at and help scale because it's not on our radars. Um, it's over-promising, as, as Vineet mentioned in one of the sessions, um, to the point where we've claimed that by tomorrow we've lifted about six billion people out of poverty, but we really don't have the evidence behind that. So it's about not creating a bubble, but rather really proving and putting sort of the impact where our mouths are. It's hyper-competition when we really need hyper-collaboration. And it, collaboration, I think, is becoming just the C word in a lot of ways. We talk about it, but we don't actually do it. And that came up in a number of the sessions by investors who want to see collaboration and by entrepreneurs that are looking into doing it with all different parts of the sector. It's solutions that promote instead of break down information asymmetries that they are encouraging them for the sake of this competition without um, bringing them to light. And it's ignoring the role of government without realizing the role that market-based solutions have in driving policy change. All of these came up in sessions as those warning signs of what we need to watch out for as we go on this journey together. So what does breakthrough look like then? <laughs> and I think, um, as Deepika promised, we've heard a lot, but we've heard a lot that we need to keep on the radar. We've heard that ambition meets transparency and accountability. That's where breakthrough is. It's when we can actually be transparent about the impact that we're having on community is where we're working. It's when the business plan is the impact plan when a successful business is the one that is having the most efficient and effective impact. It's that, it's that bottom line that encompasses social, environmental, and financial concerns at its core. It's business, government, philanthropy, and civil society driving new objectives for capital. And I'm not just talking about financial capital, you guys weren't either. We're talking about human capital, intellectual capital, social capital, that wasn't just a plug for IntelliCap, but I mean it. We, we have been talking a lot about how much more there is to you, to your organization, to your communities than just money. That's not all we need. It's new impact markets for old problems. It's saying tech is awesome, but let's also have investors focus on non-tech solutions as well. It's intergenerational and male and female-led solutions and investments. Um, it's when freedom and prosperity meet economic power and market solutions. So we heard that theme a lot. Um, it's the recognition of the market building role of grants and the market making role of investments. And this got heated in the angel investment uh, session, but it's actually addressing that head on and figuring out where strengths and weaknesses lie and how they can work together. It is corporate co-investment, acceleration, and incubation of high-impact products and services. We had reverse pitch sessions, we had partnerships with SMEs, really looking at that new corporate in this new capitalism. Um, and that might be pre-competitive, it might be pre-IP, we need to work that out if we're going to work together uh, towards, towards this new breakthrough scenario. And it's impact first and story later. And we heard that a lot as well. It's figuring out what's working, what's not, and then explaining how we got there. So with that, and in the spirit of Sankalp, which means resolve, will, determination, um, 
This is my summary, I guess, but also an invitation, which I'm sure Paradita will, will finish up with, to join this breakthrough challenge. Uh, the pitches, the South South Showcase, the open houses, they've spotlighted some of these initiatives, but I bet you found even more in the hallways. You found even more sort of in your conversations. So harness that on your uh, pathway to scale, which is what we call this, from the eureka moment to the experimenting stage to the enterprise stage, which we focused a lot on, to the ecosystem stage, which is really what we're driving here at Songkalp, and let's build this new breakthrough economy uh, where we're working together and recognizing our bond as an ecosystem, but our role in building a new form of capitalism. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. And, and folks, that was no mean accomplishment. We crunched the numbers on this, and I think Amanda summarized about 500,000 minutes of conversations. So thank you, Amanda, once again. So now we finally move on to uh, the wrap-up session. But I'm not sure that Deepika and I really want to move on from Sankalp Africa Summit. That's true. Maybe we can keep them all here permanently. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I have to say that, that hosting this conference here has been in so many ways, much more comfortable than hosting this in India. I feel more at home here. <laughs> so while we are at this, uh, we just also wanted to drop a hint to Aprajita and Vineet that Deepika and I are more than willing to shift here to Nairobi. <laughs> so I'm going to very soon call on Vineet to talk to all of you to see what we have to do next to make sure that we're able to do some work here, but we're also able to work with all of you. Uh, Vineet, can you please join us on stage? And along with Vineet, we'd also like to call on Telegap's uh, senior leadership, uh, Prajita, Nisha, Anurag. So Vineet keeps joking that Intellicap is a women-led team, and this is true, as you can see. How is it true? Two of us, two of them? And two, two of us? us. Oh, yes. <laughs> you are discriminatory. <laughs> Okay, I think, uh, yeah, the reason uh, we are all here is for, to get a very honest discussion with all of you who have spent significant time uh, in this room and in different rooms, uh, trying to make a sense of what was going on. Uh, I'll try to give you a brief background. We started Sankal five years back, six years back actually, with a very humble uh, intent of bringing entrepreneurs and investors together. Uh, the learning I had was the entrepreneurs were talking that there are no investors and in the same room the investors were saying there are no entrepreneurs. And largely the challenge was the entrepreneurs were not talking, the entrepreneur were not talking the investor's language and the investor was not able to see the entrepreneur without the language. Uh, Sankal for next last five years relentlessly focused on these two issues. Along with that we tried to build an ecosystem around these conversations to see if we can create value for everybody in the, in, in the, in the whole ecosystem. And I'm repeating the word ecosystem many times now. So having done this for five years, two years back, we started thinking about what is it that we can transfer outside of, within the IntelliCap ecosystem that we had developed. Sankalp appeared to be one format that seemed to be neutral to the geography because entrepreneurs were there and investors were there. And we thought, about, and we were instigated by some people like Anil, who, were, who was talking about a South-South collaboration, a knowledge corridor, and thought that something like Sankalp is easily transportable and could be made contextual and local in a new geography. Uh, since we are pretty simple in the way we think, we looked at Africa and then discovered it's not a country, a continent, and then we actually <laughs> made, looked at four directions, so you have North, East, South, and West, and said, okay, let's actually divide the continent into four parts and see where you can work. North is Francophone, we don't speak French. Learning will take another two years, so we dropped that. And then it was actually South Africa, we thought was actually way too advanced for us. And then East and West, and after looking at East and West, the general consensus was possibly go to East because we come from East. So <laughs> East, Africa, East Africa became, and Nairobi is where we are. Now, when you do a conference like this, what you do is you actually raise capital which is a very scarce kind of capital. Essentially, you go and try to convince people who have that grant money who want to create public good. And essentially, because we have done this public good, it's imperative on us to really uh, hold ourselves accountable to everything that we did. 
The only way we can hold ourselves accountable is to expose ourselves publicly to what we have done. And the best way to do it is to do it with you. So what I am going to do is I have picked up four individuals whom I have spoken to. Uh, I have not given them any hints of what, uh, what we expect them. We have only told them to be honest. And I will actually call upon them to give us feedback publicly. And then any of you can join them in giving us feedback. And please be candid because, as I said, the money that we have used is a very scarce capital. And if this is not good and is not useful, then possibly it should be used somewhere else. In case what we have done is useful but is not up to the mark, then possibly you should tell us how to improve it. And if there are general comments you have of where we can correct ourselves, that's welcome as well. So maybe without much ado, let me actually ask the gentleman who's uh, who has impressed me quite a lot with his enthusiasm. I met him quite twice actually outside in the corridor. His name is Okali Cosmos. Okali, in case you can give us a feedback. Thank you very much. Um, actually, this has been a very interesting outing. Um, I'm lucky I was invited by Santa Clara University, GSBI group. Uh, I happened to have gone through that program. <coughs> and uh, Pamela Rosas just sent me an email about two weeks ago, and I decided to be here. And I'm glad I'm here. Um, you've got fantastic presentations, amazing speakers, like Amanda said good sessions, a lot of addressing thorny issues, relevant issues. I think this has been a great success. Um, but on the flip side, there are areas you have to improve on. And such areas are really, uh, that area has to do with the participation of persons with disabilities. If Amanda did invite me here, no single person with disability would have participated. And the other issue is, this is a five-star hotel, but it's not really, really very disability friendly. I would like to get on that stage so that they will see me more and see my handsomeness or <laughs> ugliness. Yeah, but I can't get on there because there's no ramp. And so all in all, it's a huge success, but please include persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Akali. I think it's an important feedback for us to take back. Uh, in India, we have actually been trying to, I'm actually invested in a disabled a company that's very disabled friendly. And uh, it's by that investment, I learned about the challenges. Uh, some of these challenges, which we were quite blind to, because we don't notice them. So thanks for reminding that to me. Uh, let me actually request Amy Kiss. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So Emma Essien Lare from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, gosh, this was great. I mean, one of the things I want to say, just to congratulate you, I've said this to you in the hallway, Vinit, that you have an amazing team when they first landed in Nairobi, um, and the way they have engaged with stakeholders, really um, trying to have conversations about what would work here, is re really impressive. <coughs> that, that consultation process for me was just, um, was the kind of thing that really engendered my buy-in to this conference. So, so from, a, from a starting point of doing that, that really was excellent. Um, I really, really liked the way we started with the um, pitch sessions. Um, I felt that the energy in the room was great. Um, it was very sharp. It was organized very well. Um, it really built momentum um, for the conversations for, for today. Conferences like this can, can drag, people can get sleepy, um, distracted, but I think you did a good job of really sort of getting people engaged early on. Um, in terms of what I think was potentially missing, I think probably this conference bit off a lot. I mean, taking an ecosystem view for inclusive development in Africa is huge. 
and a lot of people just don't know what that means. Um, and so, and I wonder, I have sort of mixed feelings about this, but I wonder if, for example, in the last panel, there was a conversation about optimism and mindsets and, and leadership. If you could have taken some theme like that, something that cuts across all of what we talked about and have that be the thing that we talk about. Because we've been having conferences connecting entrepreneurs and investors, we've been doing that. Um, so that, that's not missing here, but what is missing really is sort of a common theme. So I don't know if it should have been done here because this was the first time, but certainly as you think about a next conference, you need to do that. You need to think about what is a common theme that really, and it's the same people, but it's now focused on something that really does galvanize people. That's one thing. And the second thing I would say is that um, the what's next is missing. So I know you have your ideas around that. And maybe sort of in the conversations that we had, pulling that out more deliberately from each of the conversations would have been helpful so that everybody in this room can leave here with a sense of, OK, it's not just another conference. I think Chris alluded to it earlier. There is something tangible that we have to look forward to. Thanks, thanks, Amy. Very insightful thought process. I think uh, the question about uh, the question about what next has actually been posed to us multiple times. We have been quiet deliberately because we need to understand the landscape before we start jumping to a situation. Uh, we are not known to be very, very smart on that front, so we have worked very hard to keep quiet. Uh, maybe Nisha, if I can actually ask you to give. I think to, to look from your perspective and uh, give some insights to what we have observed. Um, so thank you all so much for welcoming us, but I don't think I can summarize as well as she did, but <laughs> I can probably offer some observations, just, you know, layman observations. So first thing, I, what I noticed really was that the sectors are same, so it didn't really feel as if I was in Sankalp, Africa, frankly because all the conversations that we have had, the three sectors that I saw emerge yesterday, um, energy, food and nutrition, and health. Those are the very sectors that emerge even in India when we do this conference. So there, I didn't see a lot of difference. Um, one sector I did see that was missing here and that we see a lot of in India is financial inclusion. But I think it's because you guys have it all figured out already. So <laughs> we are still on, <laughs> we are still getting on our way. We don't have an MPESA yet. So, um, so that was one. Um, the second, of course, you know, the whole energy was very electric. It's always the case with entrepreneurs. The second, uh, which was very uh, striking to me really was when pitch sessions were happening yesterday. And one of the questions Jeff was posting, uh, posing was around how much capital are you looking for? And it was very surprising to me because, and everyone had a, a number in excess of a million dollars, actually. But if you come to Sankalp, India, and you really look at the capital raise that people are looking to do, I usually hear like $200,000, max 250. We really hardly ever get to a million dollar figure there. So that was very striking to me because I was thinking here, you have the same kind of enterprises. The ecosystem is same, I mean similar. and. They are trying to solve the problems at almost the same scale. Then why do they need so much more money? It's almost 4x of what they are raising. Um, so that was striking to me, but my, the way I'm thinking about it, or my logic tells me that it probably is the case because you don't have stages of investment here, probably. In India, we have the ecosystem a little bit more developed. We do have angels that come in with early money. You have super angels. You have impact investors. You have VCs. You have PEs. So there's a whole range that's working. Here, probably that's not the case, and that's why when the money is being raised, it's being raised in a large amount. So that was really very striking to me. So that's second observation. Final one, I won't take too much time. Um, the last one is around, if I look around the room, and I saw the entrepreneur mix even yesterday, you saw 12 pitches, right? I saw a great blend of local entrepreneurs and a lot of expat community. That's really unique to this place, um, because you don't see that in India at all. In India, you would see 95% of the entrepreneurs would be Indians. We really don't see this blend. We don't see the mix. We don't see the, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but that was definitely, you know, something that stood out to me. So those were like my three observations. I thought it may be useful for those who have come from our side to also actually share their observations while we are seeking from you. Uh, Maybe Greg, 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 where are you? Yeah, right there. 
Greg was telling me about positive energies and I thought maybe you can add some negative to it. <laughs> Greg, why don't you? Thank you, yeah, I… Oh, it is, okay. I've really enjoyed being here. I think… Close. I think the same, uh, the same content with different people probably would not have worked well, but this event worked, in my opinion, because of the specific people that showed up, so… Um, I do have a few, uh, you know, small things to say. One is I'd like everyone to look down at their name tags and raise your hand if you can't see your name. Can you see your name, anybody? Is there anyone whose name tag was backwards? Because <laughs> that was happening a lot. It's a small thing, but if you're trying to facilitate people to get to know each other, put their names on both sides. Second thing is... Um, I found the pitch, personally, the pitch session yesterday very disorienting and I was glad to hear the, uh, this woman from Rockefeller enjoyed it because I thought it was uh, difficult to sort of become oriented in a couple of ways. One is I would have liked to see the name of the enterprise behind the speaker each time just because it was not enough for me to hear this is the name, then here comes this person, there's music. I'm like confused, who, who is this person? I can't remember. Um, the second thing was, it would be nice to ask each person doing a pitch to start the pitch with a statement about where, um, where in the sequence that Amanda showed uh, that goes all the way to ecosystem and, and so on, uh, the, the, the business is. Is this a, just an idea looking for some seed money? Is it a pilot? Is it something that's already reaching a lot of people? A lot of that came out in the pitches anyway, but it would be nice to start with that so the listener can understand. Um, and then third, it's, it seems very different to me to give a pitch to uh, a jury where you really are being questioned by experts, I assume, uh, versus sort of a performance that's fun. And I thought there was an ambiguity there. I was a little confused. Like, is the moderator asking jarring questions to really elicit weaknesses of these businesses? Or is it more like just sort of entertainment? I, I couldn't quite tell. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, so I would say the last thing is really not a criticism at all, but just to say that uh, I think these kind of events are really about conversations and that word has come up a lot in the last 20 minutes. So thinking about how to maybe stray even farther from an, a model where there's an audience looking at a lecture or a panel or a pitch or whatever, straying even farther from that into getting the ball rolling on a specific conversation down a specific track and having people self-identify somehow to really participate in that. I think it's gone well. I mean, there's a lot of conversations in the hallways and stuff, so it's not really criticism. And I don't have a very creative answer for how to do that, but I think that's just echoing what people have said, and I had the same, the same thought. Very useful, Greg. Uh, I think uh, I think it was really a show, actually, because the decision was being taken somewhere else. But it's important, we have learned it in India, uh, the point that I'll take from you and which I think we have to bring properly from India is the way we present in India, we have not repeated it exactly here. So there were some weaknesses there in terms of especially the organization and the way we did it. Part of it is uh, we were also actually trying to experiment with uh, how the local ecosystem works. And uh, I think a lot of our standardization from India, we were not able to introduce properly here. Uh, and so some of those comments are actually were jarring to me as well. I was also sitting there trying to make it. And so it's pretty obvious that we had heard. Uh, but at the same time as this was our first visit, we were also trying to deal with logistics and other issues uh, and trying to understand the capacities that are there locally. It was just a learning experience for us. So the points well taken. I'm not being defensive. In fact, I actually welcome the whole idea of being told that these were the issues. They were actually the issues. In fact, I completely agree with you. Uh, hopefully next time you will see a better, much better and more progressive thing. Uh, let me request Duncan, she's around, yeah, right there. Thank you, uh, Duncan, Acumen Fund. Um, <coughs> let me start by saying that um, I, uh, you have a formidable team. Um, I've been involved in every stage uh, of this forum from preparation uh, through today. 
Um, and if I describe each stage, then that will actually you know, give you a view in terms of what I feel about, you know, <laughs> what, what, other than the content. Um, on the, in the preparation stage, um, I was visited by Aprojita and uh, Kanika. Um, and I was um, impressed by their dedication and uh, in order to, to ensure that they've got the detail and also to ensure that uh, they've got access to the right network. Um, and, you know, the way the, uh, the summit has run is a reflection of that. I, be, I was involved in the jury selection and I, you know, in the, it was intense. Uh, we argued, uh, we decided, and I believe that we actually, you know, uh, gave, uh, the result was a reflection of, um, you know, of, 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 of quite uh, intense work which began, you know, outside of this conference. The round tables, open sessions, the panels, in my opinion, have been open, honest, and it's been grounded. A lot of good examples of what's, ha what's working and what's not working, what to avoid and what to continue doing. These are things that if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an investor, you actually want to know it's, a, it's your tool of trade, and I really do appreciate that. And there was such a diverse viewpoint and backgrounds that uh, you know, it'll, it'll take me quite a while to just be able to absorb all of that. Um, in terms of what you can do better, I think you have to look beyond uh, this room and this hotel. There's a huge audience out there, and I think the thing that was missing was, and maybe, maybe it was being done, but uh, it wasn't conspicuous. And this is use of social media, being able to engage those that are out there uh, in the deliberations uh, you know, of, this, of the forum. And I think it will have, uh, have really added a uh, punch to, uh, you know, to the last two days. Um, but I would like to thank you, because I've really, really enjoyed myself, and I've taken a lot. And I hope that I've also you know, given some of, uh, some of what I have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I would like to open the feedback to anybody who would like to give us feedback right now. Uh, maybe we'll limit it to four people. The lady right there. Susan, sorry. <coughs> Hi, Suzanne Beagle here from London. I just want to say, I want to echo Emmy and Duncan and the others in just really recognizing Sankelp, overall IntelliCap, Shell and Diffid for funding this, bringing us all together. It's just been remarkable. I want to point out for those of you that didn't get to participate in the Angaza immersion, which was the day and a half before Sankelp started, that was also an extraordinary experience and I felt like more people could have taken advantage of that opportunity. We got to spend uh, time doing site visits to projects around Nairobi. We got a chance to meet investors, intermediaries, entrepreneurs in a very different kind of setting, which was really conversation, storytelling, uh, really thinking about the ecosystem um, in, a, in a sort of small group way. And that was really special. So Amani Institute, hats off. If you don't know Amani Institute, you should know this group. Um, I would love to see you create an online connected environment before, during, and after. I would love to see you include some graphic facilitation because some of us are really visual learners. Um, here we are also in Kenya, and I would, it was a little bit of music, but there's such a strong culture of art, music, culture here uh, that could have come out a little, even a little bit more to really, um, really celebrate where we are, that sense of place. Um, I feel like I got a two-week experience in three and a half days um, and I've been doing my own reflecting about what I'll take back and some of the things really are the infrastructure and examples that we can bring to help accelerate the things that we've learned with the, the right reflection about what's appropriate and what's not, um, but also very much the things that we can bring back to London and to the States. Um, things like knowing about Chamas, things about mobile innovations that are working here. It's just that that's really exciting to me. And for me, I spend a lot of my time on investor education. And there's just a tremendous need 
as I think we all heard, for educating this base of investors who don't know the real story of Africa and the two Africas. And, you know, there's, there's two Los Angeleses and two Londons and two Detroits, but, you know, to really be able to tell this story, uh, there's just so much opportunity to bring other people in and uh, you've done a great job of, of starting that, but that's one of the things I'm really thinking about. So just in deep appreciation and gratitude for the respect, the collaboration, um, the inspiredness that you bring. Um, thanks for, for making this happen. Right here. <coughs> And maybe you can go ahead and next. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. One, first, let me congratulate you for a successful summit. I believe that it's been a very useful two days. The programs, in my view, have been well coordinated. They, they are relevant. They are useful. And I think more importantly, you, in my view, you have put on the center stage what is now a global discussion, which is the concept of ecosystem, the concept of climate change, and the concept of sustainable development. I am particularly impressed because one of the things that countries like, especially in Africa, should do is how do you dovetail into the old concept of sustainability? I have the privilege of being a member of African group of negotiators on the climate change. And some of the useful papers and discussions that were made introduced the old concept of the business side of the challenges of our environment. So I must congratulate you for the substance of the program. Secondly, I was impressed with the selection. In fact, somebody who sat next to me, I did emphasize that from the presentation, the winner, in my view, appeared to have been the one that won it. I've said this because I was on the highest prize of environment and sustainable development, which was the Alcan Prize, and you could see from the presentation that there were clear indication by the winner that he addressed the center point, which happens to be the people. And I think I will need to salute the judges for doing a good job. However, I think it is important that when next you do this type of program, please have in the background, what are these people presenting? Not just let them come and talk. Like somebody rightly mentioned, is it a new idea? Is it something that is visible? At the end of the day, what are we trying to get? And I think that, in my view, is something that you may need to look at. The third point I would like to make is that I think for a program of this nature, you must develop what I call a long life relationship. And that means you must either create a platform where the participants are photographs, or there is, you develop a network, either through an email or through this, so that they can continue. There should be a continuous sharing of experience and getting things right. And I believe the last point is the point made that when you are doing this type of thing, please let us remember that there are people who are not as fortunate as you and I. They may need to be taken care of, and in this case, we are talking about people with challenges. And the last point, I think you also need to introduce a more social aspect into the program. Possibly, like rightly mentioned, a culture, a culture night or something that will depict the culture and the living of the people. And may I please request that you may need to take a closer look and try and see how you can do this in West Africa. I thank you very much.
Is this on? Okay. Hi, I'm Adam Walker. I'm from Humming Bill. We're a subscription billing company. Uh, so we automate bill calculation and bill delivery by SMS and automated phone call for businesses with illiterate consumers. Um, this has been a fantastic opportunity uh, for me. I'm a, obviously a local entrepreneur here, so I guess on behalf of many of the other entrepreneurs here, this has been awesome. Um, it's been an opportunity to meet uh, other entrepreneurs, um, as well as potential customers, as well as potential investors. So this has been fantastic for me. So thank you very much for putting this on. Um, the one point of feedback, I'll keep it really simple, is from the pitches last night, I think what would have been very helpful for the audience and potentially for the, uh, for the entrepreneurs as well, is having a standard pitch format. Um, so I've personally pitched uh, in competitions where we had a very fixed uh, process for pitching. Um, so uh, actually I'm blanking on the particular name, but there's one that you pitch and the slides are actually on auto time. Um, they're like 15 second slides and it's for a four minute pitch. So I think that would make things um, more predictable for the audience and so they can pay attention a little bit better. They're not sort of lost in a jumble of information that's just not at all predictable. But uh, anyway, that's my only point of feedback and thank you again um, for putting this on and to everybody. Thank you. Very valid feedback. In fact, we do this in India. We have to just make sure that we do it when we are doing it somewhere else uh, and take it, uh, take it as humbly as we can. Make sure next time you will not have this complaint. Uh, I think I'll let Anurag and Apraita respond to all the feedback that we have received. And after that, I'll let Deepika and uh, Kanika close out because these are the people who led us to be here. They are the ones who are possibly going to be the link between you and us going forward as well. Uh, firstly, thank you for the very positive response. I think consistently, uh, you know, heard very positive feedback on the two days. So thank you for that. Uh, I mean, uh, for us, uh, this was the first time we were here, so this was very, very critical that uh, it, it did add some value to all of you who were spending so much time here. I think each and every single feedback that came through, uh, I think each and every one of them we'll have to implement. Uh, we take that on board, and, uh, and I think uh, next time we are here, we'll definitely make sure that each of them are addressed. So. You've heard a lot more from me today, but uh, I'll keep it brief. Um, I think uh, I'll also add probably Kanika speak on, on their Kanika and Deepika's behalf as well. I think for us, it's been a great learning journey, and, and I think we're just starting it. So um, every feedback that you've given us, all the conversations that we've had in the hallway, the I, scores of meetings we've had, uh, uh, phone calls, Skype calls, the problematic ones, the smooth ones. Uh, you know, it's been, a, it's been an amazing journey for us to discover uh, what is needed, where we can add value and where we cannot. And I think where we cannot is, is probably even a bigger learning for us. Um, so I think for us also, it's, it's a time to reflect and Emmett, to your point, we are not entirely sure where we're going from here. We have a lot of ideas. We'd like to go back, seek more feedback, and, and really understand what's, what's needed, where, where we come in, and where a lot of local and regional stakeholders and organizations come in. So I think we will come back with a very clear answer in, in um, a few months, if not a few weeks. Um, and, um, and hopefully, we should be able to uh, you know, add more value to what we're doing here and, and in the process learn a lot more. Thank you. Before we close, what I actually want to let you know is that uh, at IntelliCap, we normally move forward. It's never happened in our history that we have tried to turn back. So chances are that we will not come back saying we'll not come back again. But uh, if it happens, it will be the first time in our history. So it would be a remarkable step. Uh, with the, that note, I would actually hand it over to Kanika and the Pickers. Thank you, Vineet. Um, and uh, Aprajita, Nishan, Anurag. Thank you all also for the very honest feedback. Uh, no, you can stay on stage. Um, we had a couple of people uh, who had um, reached out to us who said they wanted to make announcements about a few commitments. Uh, is Joachim from uh, Unreasonable Institute in the room? 
maybe not. Maybe he's networking outside, but Unreasonable Institute has promised to, uh, uh, they were our mentoring partners and leading a lot of the work at the mentoring clinic. So they have offered to consider uh, three of the seven enterprises that they mentored as uh, members of their cohort next year. We will include that uh, in a delegate mailer and have Unreasonable actually quote that. Uh, but unfortunately, I think Joachim had to leave. Um, yeah, and I think that one final group of people we really need to thank now are all our amazing volunteers. They've been here, uh, I think, for 48 hours straight now, and they've, they've just not said no to anything. They've always been enthusiastic, and we'd really like to take a moment here to thank you. Please come up on stage. I'd like to call on Ariel, um, who's been managing all our volunteers, and Ariel will give you a few quick brief notes about all the great work that the volunteers have done. Thanks, Kanika. Um, I've had the pleasure of working directly with these wonderful volunteers you see on stage and have no doubt interacted with throughout the summit. Um, this was the first year that we've had volunteers at the Sankalp Forum, and I honestly don't know how you've done it before without them in India. <laughs> um, I would also like to appreciate the online platforms where we found this fabulous crew, um, the Peace and Collaboration Development Network, Escape the City, and Next Billion, just to name a few. Um, we had a huge applicant pool of very experienced individuals from all over Africa. These people that we are recognizing right now are the best of the best. Um, these volunteers are mid-career and senior professionals who have given their valuable time to support Sankalp. They are an impressive talent pool for the social enterprise system here in Kenya, helping to build a collaborative community both with Sankalp and in their personal careers. Many traveled very far to be here with us. Um, as far as uh, Liberia, he took an overnight red-eye flight and came right to work. Um, I think, I'm certain we can all recognize and appreciate their time, energy, and enthusiasm. Um, so thank you all, and we would like to appreciate you with some certificates of our appreciation. So if you just wanna step forward as I call your names. Um, Abdallah Mohammed. Annette Nakiega, Calvin Sokello, George Arango, Kevin Lair, Laura Stupin, Lutz Leighton. McKenna Onjerika, <laughs> Mohamed Swari, <laughs> Rachel Estes, <laughs> Suleiman Bashir Salah, <laughs> and Vandana Totoli. <laughs> so let's give them all one big round of applause. They worked really hard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anaprajita. If we can just ask you to stay on a moment longer for a final word of thanks. Sure. This is going to take just two minutes. Uh, I know it's been a long day, and with all the starting with all the suspense around the appearance of the minister to lots of sessions and panel discussions, uh, I stand here to deliver the official vote of thanks, and I feel both humbled and inspired. Humbled to be a part of the team that got the opportunity to put, uh, put this uh, entire event together and to chart out our, our work in Africa. Um, and inspired to be amongst all of you um, and to hear the stories of determination and, and change that entrepreneurs that are living here are trying to affect in their communities and countries and regions. And for all this and more, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude and thanks Firstly, to all the enterprises and the entrepreneurs behind them who uh, participated wholeheartedly in every round of Sankalp Awards for Africa, and the summit um, proving in every possible way the power of entrepreneurship and innovation. I'd like to thank the distinguished members of the jury who set aside much time from their busy schedule, spent uh, 
close to two days with us uh, to scan each SME nomination that we received for, and for judiciously and fairly coming up with the deserving winners. Today would not have been so remarkable if it wasn't for all the speakers, panelists, and moderators who breathed life into each topic under discussion. I thoroughly enjoyed the sessions that I got to attend and one that I was a part of. Um, and while I may not really be able to name all the 60 speakers right now uh, that we heard yesterday and today, my heartfelt gratitude to all of you for taking the time and steering the discussion so well. Thank you. Next, I'd like to thank all our partners and supporters, Shell Foundation for backing us to make our first entry into Africa. Thank you, Simon, Richard, and Chris. Um, UK Aid, that extended their support and vision to Sankalp Africa in its first year. Thank you, Adrian, Seema, and Lisa. As I said earlier in the morning, our journey to put this initiative together, we met over 60 organizations, probably spoke to 200 or 250 individuals, uh, all of them who were working in Africa. Many thanks to all of them. Um, and very specifically to um, two more partners, the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, who brought open the network of cookstove enterprises who've been working in Africa, and Anne Volans. Amanda, you did a fantastic job of re recapping the whole day and yesterday. Um, thank you, Stevie, uh, from Global Alliance. Our outreach partners, Andy, Jin, Amani Institute, BC for Africa, and Next Billion. Um, you were really great in getting the word out and for engaging your networks in, in Sankalp Africa. And a quick round of thanks to people who have worked hard behind the scenes to make this event happen. My colleague Sehul Shroff, who planned the event to the finest detail and got everything up and running. Jasmine and her team from Integral Marketing, for, uh, who were our event managers, who ensures that we got our mics, food, sessions, and coffee, everything on time. Please give them a big round of applause. And finally, my congratulations and thanks to the team behind Sankalp Africa. Dipika and Kanika, both of you made it your mission this past year and gave it, all, gave it your best to make this effort shine. Take a bow and party hard tonight. All through the weekend as well, hopefully. You deserve it more than any of us. Ariel for holding fort on ground here. Ariel only joined us this January and she's been a fantastic addition to the team and is based in Nairobi. Um, Vineet, Nisha, Anurag, a big thank you to the three of you for spending countless hours and days on questioning, contributing, and making the whole process intellectually stimulating for, for me and the entire team. My colleagues from several other teams in the IntelliCAF family, Raghav, Prashant, Smita, Soumya, Nelson, Atreya, Anand, and Sanjeev, and I'm taking the advantage of saying the names of only the ones who are present here. Quite a few people back home worked on this too. Thanks for being so generous with your time and shining in every role that you played. And finally, please join me in giving them a huge round of applause and great work, team. And thanks to all of you as well for being here and, and for making this successful. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great evening ahead.